All right, Isaiah, turn in your, your Bibles. We're going to read two different verses, two different portions of Isaiah. Uh, one is from chapter 9, 6, and 7, and it represents the first section of ver chapters 1 to 39. Then we're going to read uh, Isaiah 53, 6, which represents chapters 40 through 66. I want you to think about something with me real quickly. How many books of the Bible are in the Old Testament? 39, right? Isaiah 1 through 39, recognize it. How many books of the Bible are in the New Testament? 27. Isaiah 40 through 66 is 27 chapters. And you're going to see the significance of that as we look at this, this book tonight. Stand with me if you would. I want to read these two portions. They are they're on the screens if you don't have your Bible with you. But turn to and mark, mark Isaiah 53, 6 and turn to Isaiah 9, 6 to 7. As this represents for us the... The condemnation, the tone of condemnation, the judgment in chapters 1 through 39, and the, and the comfort and consolation that shows up in chapters 40 through 66. For to us a child is born, to us a son is given, and the government shall be upon his shoulder, and his name shall be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. And of the increase of his government and peace, there will be no end. On the throne of David and over his kingdom, to establish it and up, to uphold it with justice and with righteousness from this time forth and forevermore. The zeal of the Lord of hosts will do this. A picture of the Messiah as one who will, will reign and rule sovereignly, upholding justice and righteousness. Isaiah 53, 6. All we like sheep have gone astray. We have turned every one to his own way. And the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. Would you notice the government shall be upon his shoulder. Our sins were also placed upon him by God's grace. We've read together what? The inerrant, infallible, all-sufficient word of God. We're going to watch now. What I've asked Michelle to do is we're going to show both videos, part one and part two, to give you a flavor. And if I don't get through this tonight, then we'll dial up part two next Sunday evening. Thank you. Please be seated. The book of the prophet Isaiah. Isaiah lived in Jerusalem in the latter half of Israel's kingdom period, and he spoke on God's behalf to the leaders of Jerusalem and Judah. He spoke, first of all, a message of God's judgment. He warned Israel's corrupt leaders that their rebellion against their covenant with God would come at a cost, that God was going to use the great empires of Assyria and after them Babylon to judge Jerusalem if they persisted in idolatry and oppression of the poor. But that announcement was combined with a message of hope. Isaiah believed deeply that God would one day fulfill all of his covenant promises, that he would send a king from David's line to establish God's kingdom, remember 2 Samuel 7, that he would lead Israel in obedience to all of the laws of the covenant made at Mount Sinai, remember Exodus chapter 19. And all of this was so that God's blessing and salvation would flow outward to all of the nations, like God promised to Abraham in Genesis chapter 12. And it's this hope that compares compelled Isaiah to speak out against the corruption and idolatry of Israel in his day. Now, the book has a pretty complex literary design, but there's one simple way to see how it all fits together. Chapters 1 through 39 contain three large sections that develop Isaiah's warning of judgment on Israel. And it all culminates in an event pointed to at the end of chapter 39, the fall of Jerusalem and the exile of the people to Babylon. But in chapters 1 to 39, there's also a message of hope that after the exile, God's covenant promises would all be fulfilled. And chapters 40 to 66 pick up that promise of hope and develops it further. In this video, we're just going to focus on chapters 1 to 39. The first main section focuses on Isaiah's vision of judgment and hope for Jerusalem, and it begins as Isaiah accuses the city's leaders of covenant rebellion, idolatry, injustice, and God says he's going to judge the city by sending the nations to conquer Israel. Isaiah says that this will be like a purifying fire that burns away all that's worthless in Israel in order to create a new Jerusalem that's populated by a remnant that has repented and turned back to God, and Isaiah says that that's when God's kingdom 
kingdom will come and all nations will come to the temple in Jerusalem and learn of God's justice, bringing about an age of universal peace and harmony. Now, it's this basic storyline of the old Jerusalem purifying judgment into the new Jerusalem. This is going to get repeated over and over throughout the book, getting filled in with increasing detail. So, at the center of this section is Isaiah's grand vision of God sitting on his throne in the temple. And he's surrounded by these heavenly creatures that are shouting that God is holy, holy, holy. And Isaiah suddenly realizes just how corrupt he and his people Israel are. And he's certain that he's going to be destroyed by God's holiness, but he's not. God's holiness, in the form of this burning coal, comes and burns him, but not to destroy. Rather, it purifies him from his sin. And as Isaiah ponders the strange experience, God commissions him with a very difficult task. He is to keep announcing this coming judgment, but because Israel has reached a point of no return, his warnings are going to have a paradoxical effect of hardening the people. But Isaiah is to trust God's plan. Israel is going to be chopped down like a tree and left like a stump in a field. And that stump will itself be scorched and burned. But after all of that burning, God says that this smoldering stump is a holy seed that will survive into the future. It's a small sign of hope, but who or what is that holy seed? The rest of this section offers an answer. Isaiah confronts Ahaz, a descendant of David and a king of Jerusalem, and he announces his downfall. God says that it's the great empire of Assyria who will first chop Israel down and devastate the land, but there's hope. Because of God's promise to David, he's going to send after this destruction a new king named Emmanuel, which means God with us. And Emmanuel's kingdom is going to set God's people free from violent, oppressive empires. And Isaiah describes this coming king as a small shoe of new growth that will emerge from the old stump of David's family. It's this king that's the holy seed from chapter 6. And the king is going to be empowered by God's spirit to rule over a new Jerusalem and bring justice for the poor, and all nations will look to this messianic king for guidance. His kingdom will transform all creation, bringing peace. Now, you finish chapters 1 through 12 with a pretty good understanding of Isaiah's message of judgment and hope. But when will this all happen? Isaiah saw another empire arising after Assyria, and that's Babylon, who would also attack Jerusalem and actually succeed in destroying it. And that brings us into the next sections of the book. So first, we have a large collection of poems that explore God's judgment and hope for the nations. We learn, first of all, of the fall of Babylon and Israel's neighbors. Isaiah could see that Assyria's world power would one day be replaced by the empire of Babylon, a nation even more destructive and arrogant. And Babylon's kings claimed that they were higher than all other gods, and so God vows to bring Babylon down. And not only Babylon. Isaiah goes on to list Israel's neighbors, accusing them all of the same kind of pride and injustice, and he predicts their ultimate ruin. But remember, for Isaiah, God's judgment is never the final word for Israel or the nations. And that leads into the next section with a series of poems that tell a tale of two cities. There's the lofty city that has exalted itself above God and become corrupt and unjust. This city is an archetype of rebellious humanity and is described with language that's all borrowed from Isaiah's earlier descriptions of Jerusalem and Assyria and Babylon all put together. This city is destined for ruin and one day is going to be replaced by the New Jerusalem, where God reigns as king over a redeemed humanity from all nations, and there's no more death or suffering. These chapters are the climax to this section, and it shows how Isaiah's message pointed far beyond his own day. It was a message for all who are waiting for God to bring his justice on violent, oppressive kingdoms and bring his kingdom of justice and peace and healing love. The following section returns the focus to the rise and fall of Jerusalem. And first we find a whole bunch of poems where Isaiah accuses Jerusalem's leaders for turning to Egypt for military protection against Assyria. He knows this will backfire. And Isaiah says that only trust in their God and repentance can save Israel now. Which gets illustrated by the following story about the rise of Hezekiah, king of Jerusalem. Just as Isaiah predicted, the Assyrian armies come and try to attack the city. And so Hezekiah humbles himself before God and he prays for divine deliverance, and the city is miraculously saved overnight. 
But Hezekiah's rise is immediately followed by his fall. So he hosts a delegation from Babylon and he tries to impress them by showing everything in Jerusalem's treasury and temple and palaces. It's clearly an effort to make another political alliance for protection. Isaiah hears about this and he confronts Hezekiah for his foolishness. He predicts that this ally will one day betray him and return as an enemy to conquer Jerusalem. And we know from 2 Kings chapters 24 and 25 that Isaiah was right. Over a hundred years later, Babylon would turn on Jerusalem, come and destroy the city, its temple, and carry the Israelites away to exile in Babylon. And so all of Isaiah's warnings of divine judgment in chapters 1 to 39 lead up to this moment. He's shown to be a true prophet because it all came to pass like he said. But remember, the purpose of God's judgment was to purify Jerusalem and bring the holy seed and messianic kingdom over all nations. And it's that hope that gets explored in the next part of the book. But for now, that's what Isaiah chapters 1 to 39 are all about. The book of the prophet Isaiah. In the first video, we explored chapters 1 to 39, which was Isaiah's message of judgment and hope for Jerusalem. He accused Israel's leaders of rebellion against God and said that through Assyria and then Babylon, Israel's kingdom would come crashing down in an act of God's judgment. And so chapter 39 concluded with Isaiah predicting Jerusalem's fall to Babylon and the exile. And a hundred years after Isaiah, it all sadly came to pass. But Isaiah's greater hope was for a new purified Jerusalem where God's kingdom would be restored through the future messianic king and all nations would come together in peace. And so chapters 40 and following explore this great hope. The first main section, chapters 40 to 48, open with an announcement of hope and comfort for Israel. The people are told that the Babylonian exile is over and that Israel's sin has been dealt with, a new era is beginning. So they should all return home to Jerusalem where God himself will bring his kingdom and all nations will see his glory. Now, let's stop for a moment because this opening announcement raises a big question, that is, who is saying all of this? Whose voice are we hearing in these words of hope? The perspective of the prophet in these chapters is that of somebody who's living after the exile, in other words, in the time period described by Ezra and Nehemiah. But Isaiah died 150 years before any of that. So what are we supposed to make of this? Well, there are many who think that it's still Isaiah in his own day speaking, but that he's been prophetically transported, so to speak, 200 years into the future, and that he's speaking to future generations generations as if the exile is past. However, the book of Isaiah itself gives us some clues that something else is probably going on. In chapters 8 and 29 and 30, we're told that after Isaiah was rejected by Israel's leaders, that he wrote and sealed up in a scroll all of his messages of judgment and hope, and that he passed it on to his disciples as a witness for days to come. Eventually, Isaiah died, waiting for God to vindicate his words. Now remember, chapters 1 to 39 were designed to show us that Isaiah's predictions of judgment were fulfilled in the exile. He's a true prophet. And so after exile is over, Isaiah's disciples, who have treasured his words for so long, open up the scroll and begin applying his words of hope to their own day. So on this view, the book of Isaiah consists of that first collection of Isaiah's words as well as the writings of his prophetic disciples that God uses to extend Isaiah's message of hope to future generations. Whichever view you end up taking, everybody agrees that these chapters are announcing that the future hope has come, that God is fulfilling Isaiah's prophetic promises. And so the prophet hopes that Israel will respond by becoming God's servant. That is, after experiencing God's justice and mercy through through history, that they will now begin to share with the nations who God truly is. But that's not what's happening. Israel, instead of bearing witness to the nations, is actually complaining and even accusing God. They say, the Lord doesn't pay attention to our trouble. In fact, he's ignoring our cause. The Babylonian exile, understandably, caused Israel to lose faith in their God. I mean, maybe he's not that powerful. Maybe the gods of Babylon are way greater than our God. And so the rest of these chapters, 41 to 47, are set up like a trial scene. God is responding to these doubts and accusations with the following arguments. He says first that the exile to Babylon was not divine neglect. Rather, it was divinely orchestrated as a judgment for Israel's sin. 
And second, it was for Israel's sake that God raised up Persia to conquer Babylon so they could come back home fulfilling Isaiah's words. So the right conclusion that Israel should draw is that their God is the king of history, not the idols of the nations. In the fall of Babylon and the rise of the Persian king Cyrus, Israel should see God's hand at work and so become his servant, telling the nations who he is. But by the end of the trial, chapter 48, we find that Israel is still as rebellious and hard-hearted as their ancestors. And so God disqualifies them as his servant, but God still is on a mission to bless the nations. And so the prophet says God's going to do a new thing to solve this problem, which moves into the next section, 49 to 55. We're introduced to a figure who's called God's servant, who's going to fulfill God's mission and do what Israel has failed to do. God gives this servant the title Israel and sends this person on a mission to, first of all, restore the people of Israel back to their God, but second, to become God's light to the nations. And we're told that this servant is empowered by God's spirit to announce good news and to bring God's kingdom over all of the nations. It sounds just like the Messianic king from chapters 9 and 11. But then we learn the surprising way of how the servant will bring God's kingdom. He's going to be rejected and beaten and ultimately killed by his own people. In reality, as he's being accused and sentenced to death, he's dying on behalf of the sin of his own people. The prophet says the servant's death is a sacrifice of atonement for the people's evil and rebellion. And then, after his death, all of a sudden, the servant is just alive again. And we hear that by his death, he provided a way to make people righteous. That is, to put them in a right relationship with God. And so this section concludes by describing two ways people can respond to the servant. Some will respond with humility and turn from their sins and accept what God's servant did on their behalf. These people are called the servants, and also the seed. Remember the holy seed from chapter 6. These are the ones who will experience the blessing of the messianic kingdom. But there are others who are called simply the wicked, and they reject both the servant and his servants, which brings us to the final section of the book, 56 to 66, where the servants inherit God's kingdom. These chapters are beautifully designed as a symmetry that brings together all of the themes of the book. At the very center are three beautiful poems that describe how the spirit-empowered servant is announcing the good news of God's kingdom to the poor. And he reaffirms all of the promises of hope from earlier in the book. The new Jerusalem, inhabited by God's servants, will be the place from which God's justice and mercy and blessing flow out to all the nations of the world. And surrounding these poems are two long prayers of repentance, where the servants confess Israel's sin and they grieve over all of the evil they see in the world around them. And so they ask God to forgive them and that his kingdom would come here on earth as it is in heaven. Now, on each side of these prayers are collections of more poems that contrast the destiny of the servants with that of the wicked who persecute them. God says he's going to bring his justice on all who pollute his good world with their evil and selfishness and idolatry, and that he's going to remove them from his city forever. But the servants, those who are humble before God and who repent and own their evil, they are forgiven and they will inherit the new Jerusalem, which we discover is an image for an entirely renewed creation where death and suffering are gone forever. And this brings us to the very outer frame of this part of the book. In this renewed world of God's kingdom, people from all nations are invited to come and join the servants of God's covenant family so that everyone can know their creator and redeemer. And so the book of Isaiah ends with the very grand vision of the fulfillment of all of God's covenant promises. Through the suffering servant king, God creates a covenant family of all nations who are awaiting the hope of God's justice and bringing a renewed creation, where God's kingdom finally comes here on earth as it is in heaven. And that's the very powerful hope of the book of Isaiah. That's a lot to take in, but you, you get a sense of why it's appropriate to call Isaiah the Mount Everest of Old Testament prophecy. When you stand on the peaks of Isaiah, you take in the whole panorama of God's history uh, with his people. And so what I want to do with that in the background 
is talk about uh, the things we typically talk about when we're looking at these books to get to uh, the, the critical part, and that's seeing Jesus in Isaiah. And I think you'll pick up from the video that there's a lot of, of uh, imagery and references to Messiah. So let's go ahead and, and, and get into this. Isaiah is uh, called the pinnacle of the prophets. There are several designations you'll find from different people. Uh, the message of condemnation is Isaiah 1 to 39. Isaiah 40 to 66 is the, uh, is the consolation. Uh, we'll, get to, we'll read you from here in just a little while. Uh, I want to break down what I, what I call a survey. There's this, uh, the prophecies of condemnation run from 1-1 1, 1 to 35-10. Uh, this emphasis is on judgment. Uh, it has a real prophetic tone to it. And you see how that breaks down the prophecies against Judah, the prophecies against the nations who, will, who God will use to punish his people, the prophecies of the day of the Lord. This day of the Lord is this, this day of, of vengeance when God comes uh, and settles all matters. That's interesting as you read through the Old Testament, this term, term day of the Lord becomes in the Revelation, you pick it up somewhat in the New Testament, the Lord's day. I was in the Spirit on the Lord's day, and so it becomes the day of, the day of rest because this God is the God who judges uh, sin in righteousness. And so then you have the prophecies of judgment and blessing, which comes next. And after that, let's see the next, next slide. There's this historical parenthesis is what, what uh, one uh, commentary called it that I looked at. And it's, the, uh, it's, it's Hezekiah's uh, salvation, sickness, and sin. And God, God finally uh, brings uh, some judgment upon him as well. And so, so there you have the, the first part of Isaiah. The, the second part, chapters 40 to 66, uh, are the prophecies of comfort. So you have this, the contrast, prophecies of condemnation, prophecies of comfort. And uh, there's a real messianic emphasis. Messianic, we mean a lot of emphasis upon the Messiah, uh, the coming of Messiah, the person of Messiah, the rule and reign of Messiah. So it speaks of Israel's deliverance, uh, of Israel's deliverer, who he is, and then the glorious future that Israel has because they have a God who loves them and who, who in covenant with David, has promised to to be their God and they be his people. If you want a time frame for this, Isaiah is considered to be an, an eighth century prophet, which means he began prophesying in the 700s and carries over into uh, 680 BC. Some have called this book the, the gospel according to Isaiah. And that the, the, we want to delve a little deeper into the, to the breakdown that I just gave you, the prophecies of condemnation. In chapters 1 through 12, he aims this at, at uh, his fellow countrymen of Judah. And if you read through chapter 1, it sort of capsulizes, it kind of gives us a, an idea of where the whole book is going. Uh, let's, just, let's just pick up a little flavor of that real quickly. Turn to chapter 1 of Isaiah. Listen to this. And it opens up the prophets. I told you we were going to see some words here, the burden, the vision. The vision of Isaiah, the son of Amos, which he saw concerning Judah and Jerusalem in the days of Uzziah, Jotham, Ahaz, Hezekiah. So it gives you there the span of Isaiah's ministry. It spans over four kings, the wickedness of Judah. Hear, O heavens, and give ear, O earth, for the Lord has spoken. Children have I reared and brought up, but they have rebelled against me. The ox knows its owner, the donkey its master's crib, but Israel does not know. My people do not understand. Ah, sinful nation, a people laden with iniquity, offspring of evildoers, children who deal corruptly. They've forsaken the Lord. They've despised the Holy One of Israel. They're utterly estranged. Why will you still be struck down? Why will you continue to rebel? The whole head is sick. The whole heart is faint. From the sole of the foot even to the head, there is no soundness in it. Bruises and sores and raw wounds. You hear this tone here. Head to toe, my people are corrupt. Head to toe, my people are rebased. Head to toe, my people have forgotten me. Something that an ox doesn't even do. 
And so you, 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 you get this. Well, get, go over and just move forward here to chapter 1, verse 18 and following. Come now. Let us reason together, says the Lord. Though your sins are like scarlet, they shall be as white as snow. Though they are red like crimson, they shall be like wool. If you're willing and obedient, you shall eat the good of the land. But if you refuse and rebel, you shall be eaten by the sword. For the mouth of the Lord has spoken. Do you see this, this contrast, this, this promise of hope? Let's reason together. Though your sins are scarlet, they'll be white as snow. But if you don't, if you don't, judgment will come. So, so this kind of captures for us the, the essence of the whole, the whole book of Isaiah. Condemnation, consolation. Rejection because of rebellion, the promise of redemption because of mercy. And so when you, uh, of course, everybody should know Isaiah 6. In the year that King Uzziah died, I saw the Lord high and lifted up. His train filled the temple. And he talks about the, the cherubim crying out, holy, 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 but echoing back and forth with six wings. And in the midst of that, he says, he's, he's gripped with the holiness of God. Woe is me, for I'm undone. I'm a man of unclean lips. I dwell in the midst of a people of unclean lips. For my eyes have seen the King, the Lord of hosts. And of course, that's what happens out of that is the commissioning of Isaiah. Go and tell this people. And the message that God gives him, I don't know many who would volunteer for this. Listen to this. Verse, chapter 6, verse 8. And I heard the voice of the Lord saying, Whom shall I send? Who will go for us? Then I said, Here am I. Send me. And he said, Go. And say to this people, Keep on hearing, but do not understand. Keep on seeing, but do not perceive. He tells him in, the, his, in his preaching, what is, Make the heart of this people dull, and their ears heavy, Blind their eyes, lest they see with their eyes, hear with their ears, understand with their hearts, turn and be healed. Isaiah is commissioned to go on a ministry that by the nature of what he's preaching from God to them, it will be met with, with rejection and hardness and hardening. And Isaiah says, how long, O oh Lord? How long shall I carry on this mission? Until the cities lie waste without inhabitants. He's talking about exile here. Houses without people. Land is a desolate waste. The Lord removes people far away. The forsaken places are many in the midst. So, so he has this commissioning that's not pleasant. But he goes faithfully. So there's this, there's this imagery of, of this Emmanuel that comes up. I want to just show you some verses of this. We're going to look at some here. Isaiah, Isaiah 7, 14. Therefore, the Lord himself will give you a sign. He's, he's, he's rebuking Ahaz. So ask for a sign. He says, I'm not going to ask for a sign. He says, okay, fine. Since you've decided to rebel against the Lord, he's going to give you a sign. Behold, the virgin shall conceive and bear a son, and shall call his name Emmanuel. I've told you before about prophecy. There's a term we use called proleptic. Prophecy has, a, has a, a, an immediate or near immediate fulfillment, but it also has an ultimate fulfillment. We don't know in this case what the, what the near immediate fulfillment was, if there was an unusual birth that took place that was commonly known among the people, but the ultimate fulfillment is clear. Emmanuel. Emmanuel is Hebrew, Imanu El. El, of course, the name for God. Imanu with us. His name should be called Emmanuel. God will be with us. Then Isaiah 8, 14, look at that. He will become a sanctuary and a stone of offense and a rock of stumbling to both houses of Israel, a trap and a snare to the inhabitants of Jerusalem. God be with us, yet his presence will not be embraced. Isaiah 9, 2, the people who walked in darkness have seen a great light. Those who dwelt in a land of deep darkness, on them light has shone. So, so he will be light. He will bring light to the people of God and light to the nations. We read Isaiah 9, 6, uh, and seven, for unto us a child is born, to us a son is given. We've already read that, this, this promise that a child will be born. And the designation is given to him. Uh, the government of God is upon his shoulder. In other words, he carries it. He is responsible for it. He is authorized by God. 
He's wonderful counselor, mighty God, everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. Interesting names that you would not assign to a mere human. Everlasting Father? No. We're speaking here of, 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 a, of a deity, of a divinity. And so it goes on there. Isaiah 11, 1 and 2. There shall come forth a shoot from the stump of Jesse. We saw that imagery up there on the, in the video where God would come and burn, cut down and burn the tree of Israel, which is his people. But out of that a shoot would come up from the stump of Jesse, a branch from which his roots shall bear fruit. Of course, David was the son of Jesse. And the spirit of the Lord shall rest upon him, the spirit of wisdom and understanding, the spirit of counsel and might, the spirit of knowledge and the fear of the Lord. This is a descriptive again. Of the, of, of, the, of the Messiah coming. So he moves in his, in his prophecies of judgment from a regional to more of a, of a, of a global. He, he talks about the surrounding nations. And if you read from chapters 13 to 23, he mentions Babylon, Assyria, Philistia, Moab, uh, Damascus, Syria, Ethiopia, Egypt, Babylon, Edom, Arabia, and then Jerusalem and Tyre. In chapters 24 to 27, there's a section that some of the, some of the uh, students of this book call the Little Apocalypse, if you understand that language. Revelation is the apocalypse. It's the, it's the, the big unfolding. Isaiah 24 to 27 is a little apocalypse. It, it describes a, a universal time of tribulation followed by blessings of the kingdom of God. In chapters 28 to 33, there's these six woes on Israel and Judah for specific sins that they've committed. And he closes this tone of condemnation uh, with this imagery in chapters 34 and 35 of, of international devastation that is the, is the harbinger of uh, universal blessing that will follow after that. So as we, we said to you in this descriptive there that, that there's this historical parenthesis, chapters 36 to 39. Uh, and it, it goes back to, if you, it's describing the Assyrian invasion of Judah in 701 B.C. But it anticipates, as it describes that, it anticipates the coming Babylonian invasion of Judah. Uh, Judah escapes, if you know the history there, captivity by Assyria. You can read uh, chapters 36 and 37, or, or 2 Kings 18 and 19. We looked at that when we went through Kings. But they will not escape from the hands of, the, of Babylon. Chapters 38 and 39 speak to that. God answers King Hezekiah's prayer, you remember, delivers Judah from Assyrian destruction by Sennacherib. Hezekiah turns to the Lord in his illness and is granted a 15-year extension of his life. That's an interesting read. But he foolishly shows all of his treasures to the Babylonian messengers. Isaiah tells him that the Babylonians will one day carry his treasure and descendants to the land of Babylon. And so you come out of that into chapter 40 and you get this different movement, these prophecies of comfort. I want to read for you how chapter 40 begins. It is, other than chapter 53 of Isaiah, chapter 40 is one of the most marvelous passages in all of the prophets. With, with the promise of utter destruction and annihilation both among the people of God and the nations around them. Notice how chapter 40 opens up. Comfort Comfort my people, says your God. Speak tenderly to Jerusalem and cry to her that her warfare is ended, that her iniquity is pardoned, that she has received from the Lord's hand double for all his, her sins. I'll say parenthetically, if you're someone who loves Handel's Messiah, uh, I love Handel's Messiah. I pull it out and play it every Christmas season. This is one of those great uh, uh, anthems in the midst of that, the choruses. Uh, beautiful. A voice cries in the wilderness, prepare the way of the Lord. That makes you, you hear that and what do you think of? John the Baptist. Right? Make straight in the desert a highway for our God. Every valley shall be lifted up, every mountain and hill made low. The uneven ground shall become level and the rough places plain. The glory of the Lord shall be revealed and all flesh shall see it together. For the mouth of the Lord has spoken it. These, uh, these promises, and, and you move through this, I would encourage you, if you haven't read the 40th chapter in a while, just make time to do that this week sometime, because he moves through this, uh, 
What shall I cry? All flesh is like grass. In other words, it's here today and gone. The grass withers. The flower fades. The breath the Lord blows on it. The word of God stands forever, even though all flesh is like grass. Go to the high mountain, O Zion. And you, if you're, from, again, familiar with Handel's Messiah, you read this and you just, there's music that comes to my head from the, the great choruses and oratorios in this. In this. But he comes down and he, he paints this picture of the sovereignty of God, which is one of the most powerful in all of Scripture. Listen to him in chapter, in chapter 40, verse 12. Who has measured the waters in the hollow of his hand? Get the picture here. He says, to God, all the waters of the earth can be put into the hollow. Who has measured the waters in the hollow? And marked off the heavens with a span. The picture there is, and we know that God doesn't have a body like man, but he's, he's using anthropomorphic language here. That if God were to measure the heavens, he could simply hold his hand up and be taken in between his thumb and his tiny finger. That's a span. And marked off the heavens with a span. In, in closed the dust of the earth in a measure and weighed the mountains in scales and the hills in a balance. Who has measured the spirit of the Lord? Or what man shows him his counsel? Whom did he consult and who made him understand? Who taught him the path of justice? This, you, when you, we went through Job together. These, these questions sound very familiar to what, Job, what God pressed upon Job. Who taught him the path of justice, taught him knowledge, showed him the way of understanding? Behold, the nations are like a drop from a bucket. The, the idea of a, turning a bucket upside down and, and it's unclear whether it's a drop of liquid or a drop of, of grain, but turning upside down and one drop falls out. He said, that's the nations compared to our God. And are counted as the dust on the scale. Behold, he takes up the coastlands like fine dust. Lebanon would not suffice for fuel. All the trees of the cedars of Lebanon would not suffice as, as enough to make an offering to this God. Nor are its beasts enough for burnt offering. All the nations are as nothing before him. They are accounted by him as less than nothing and emptiness. To whom then will you liken God? Or what likeness compare with him? An idol. A craftsman crafts it. And a goldsmith overlays it with gold and cast it for its silver chains. Cast for its silver chains. And who is too impoverished for an offering? He who is too impoverished for an offering chooses wood that will not rot. He seeks out a skilled craftsman to set up an idol that will not move. Do you not know? Do you not hear? Has it not been told you from the beginning? Have you not understood from the foundations of the earth? It is he who sits above the circle of the earth. And its inhabitants are like grasshoppers, who stretches out the heavens like a curtain and spreads them like a tent to dwell in, who brings princes to nothing and makes the rulers of the earth as emptiness. Scarcely are they planted, scarcely sown, scarcely has their stem taken root in the earth when he blows on them and they wither. And the tempest carries them off like stubble. To whom then will you compare me that I should be like him, says the Holy One. Lift up your eyes on high and see who created these. He who brings out their host by number. Now he's talking about the, the starry host. Calling them all by name by the greatness of his might, and because he is strong in power, not one is missing. Why do you say, O Jacob, and speak, O Israel, my way is hidden from the Lord, my right is disregarded by my God? Have you not known? Have you not heard? The Lord is the everlasting God, the creator of the ends of the earth. He does not faint or grow weary. His understanding is unsearchable. He gives power to the faint. And to him who has no might, he increases strength. Notice the shift in the tone here. He's painted this incredible portrait of the majesty, of the, the unmitigated majesty of God. He gives power to the faint. To him who has no might, he increases strength. Even youths shall faint and be weary. Young men shall fall exhausted. But they who wait for the Lord 
shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings like eagles. They shall run and not be weary. They shall walk and not faint. It's one of the greatest pictures in all of Scripture of what one fellow called the majesty and mercy of God. And so this is the God with whom they have to do. This is the God who in covenant has promised to keep a man uh, on the throne of David, of Father David. And that man is coming in time. But he's also the God who is so vast, so immense, so sovereign, so powerful that he will, he will destroy anything, anyone that dares to challenge his authority. So this, this is how the, the, uh, the second section begins. And it's interesting that God uses uh, Babylon, the Babylonians to carry them off. They're, very, they're harsh. They're a, they're a bitterly harsh taskmaster, vicious conquerors. And then God punishes Babylon for what they did to his people. That's the sovereignty of our God, our comfort us. And, of course, you move in this section to the... Uh, to this Savior, the suffering servant. Years ago, I went to a debate with one of the, great, one of the leading Hebrew uh, scholars. He was, he's a uh, professor of New Testament, but he was a Hebrew scholar, an evangelical Christian. And he debated one of the leading Jewish Hebrew scholars whose forte was he was an expert in the Greek New Testament, which is unusual. You don't find that. And they were discussing who, who is Isaiah 53 intended to reflect upon. And the Hebrew, the Jewish fellow, kept pushing. This is, this is what Jews believe, that Isaiah 53 is a picture of the nation of Israel. That Israel has always suffered uh, for other people. Has always suffered because of the sins of the nation. And that's God's plan. And one day they will reign, the nation. And so this professor, uh, the evangelical Christian, just kept pressing Isaiah 53. And he read through it and he said, this, is, this language is not about a nation of people. This is about a person. And pressed him and pressed him. And finally, in the debate, the man said, well, I will grant you that this is messianic. But this is talking about the Messiah who will come to save the Gentiles. This is not the Messiah who will come to save the Jews. That was this, that's all he could finally do when this professor just lovingly, biblically backed him into a corner to realize you've got to look at Isaiah 53 and you see a man there, a person there. And so the, uh, the 53rd chapter uh, Chapters 49 through 57 concentrate on the coming of the Messiah who will be a savior and a suffering servant. Um, the promise in 58 to 66, we're going to come back to 53 in a minute. The promise in 58 to 66 is that, uh, that all who trust in him, acknowledge their sins and trust in him. And listen, I said to you, this is an evangelical prophet. The gospel, gospel tones and pictures are all through this. All who acknowledge their sins and trust in him will be delivered. That's chapters 58 to 66. In that day, Jerusalem will be rebuilt, and depending on your perspective on last things, uh, Israel's borders will be enlarged. The Messiah will reign in Zion. God's people will confess their sins. His enemies will be judged. Peace, prosperity, and justice will prevail. And God will make all things new. So let's, let's shift gears a little bit now. That's kind of a survey of it and look at the, the title of it and move, try to move through some other things here. One writer said, and this is why I asked you at the beginning, said, Isaiah is like a miniature Bible. The first 39 chapters, like the 39 books of the Old Testament, are filled with judgment upon immoral and idolatrous men. Judah has sinned. The surrounding nations have sinned. The whole earth has sinned. Judgment must come, for God cannot allow such blatant sin to go unpunished forever. But when you shift to chapter 40, these final 27 chapters, like the 27 books of the New Testament, they declare a message of hope. The Messiah is coming as a savior and a sovereign to bear a cross and wear a crown. Isaiah's prophetic ministry spanning the reigns of four kings of Judah. And it covers at least 40 years. I don't know if I said that earlier. His name, Yeshayahu, 
is shortened to Yeshaya. And it means in Hebrew, Yahweh is salvation. The Greek form of it is Hesias, the Latin Esias. And so we get our word Isaiah from, from those, those, we transliterate that over. Isaiah's also been called, when we think about the authorship of the book, and I do believe that Isaiah is the author of the book. We'll take a little exception with our, with our videos, that under God, uh, divinely uh, led by the Spirit, holy men wrote as they were led by the Spirit, the Scripture says in Peter. But he's called the St. Paul of the Old Testament. When you read his writings, and I'm, I'm taking this from someone because I'm, I, I took Hebrew in seminary, but don't hold a gun to me on, on that. I, I'd be in trouble. Uh, but it's Hebrew, I'm told by experts, uh, evinces a, an educated person uh, with a great vocabulary. Uh, there's a comprehensive scope to his prophecies over 40 years. He had, he had friends in the royal court in fact, it's, it's believed that he was a boyhood friend of, of, of Uzziah. In the year that King Uzziah died, it was not, not simply a, a, a sadness to the people because someone in the royal court had died. It was a, it was a loss of a, of a friend. But he doesn't let that hold him back. He doesn't compromise the word. He preaches an uncompromising, sincere, compassionate message to the people. His wife was a prophetess, we're told, and he had at least two sons. I want you to just look at this real quickly for a little biographical con context. Isaiah 7, 3, the Lord said to Isaiah, Go out to meet Ahaz, you and Shear Jeshub, your son, at the end of the conduit of the upper pool on the highway to the washer's field. Isaiah 8, 3, And I went to the prophetess, and she conceived and bore a son. Then the Lord said to me, Call his name Maher Shahalal Hashbaz another son. Spent most of his time ministering in, in Jerusalem. And tradition, this is not biblical now, but tradition says uh, that his persecutors finally sawed him in two during the reign of, of the wicked king Manasseh. Look at Hebrews 11.37 though. This heroes, this hall of heroes of the faith. It says they were stoned, they were sawn in two. We don't know uh, anyone specifically that's, that's mentioned in the scripture, they were killed with the sword. They went out, went about in skins of sheep and goats, destitute, afflicted, mistreated. I won't go into the, bog you down with all the details about the challenges to the book. There's, when I was in seminary, uh, there was some teaching, it was Deutero Isaiah, which meant there were two, two diff different authors to Isaiah, one chapter 31 to 39, one chapter 40 to 66. They were, there was even a guy I went to a seminar one time when I was in, in working on my advanced degree that talked about Trito Isaiah, that there were three contributors. Uh, I think that's okay if you have that kind of time, but I think it's a waste of time finally because I believe in the spirit of prophecy. We read that this morning in Revelation 19. It is not a problem for God to communicate to a prophet something that's going to happen 100 years or more later. He was, he was living in the 8th century. He certainly communicated the coming of Jesus uh, 800 years later. So, so that's fine. I, just so you know, when you come across reading somebody and they talk about Deutero, Isaiah, and, that I believe in the unity of the book of Isaiah, that he is the prophet who is the author of all of it and, and shows the power of God in prophecy by predicting things that do not come to pass uh, in those explicit ways but, so that people can identify. But when he's dead... They come to pass with crystal clear connection. Uh, so I won't go into a lot of that with you. Um, and here's, the, here's one of the linchpins for me. Isaiah 42, 9. Behold, the former things have come to pass. Okay? And new things I now declare. Before they spring forth, I tell you. Of them. And so this is, this is the, the prophetic spirit that, that rested upon Isaiah. Another thing that makes me believe that he wrote the whole thing is, is the citations of Isaiah in the New Testament. Just look at some of them with me. 
John 12, 37 to 41 quotes Isaiah 6, so that would be in the first section. John 12, 37. Though he had done so many signs before them, they still did not believe him, I'm talking about Jesus, so that the word spoken by the prophet Isaiah might be fulfilled, Lord, who has believed what, the, what he's heard from us? To whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? And that's from Isaiah 53. That's what we're going to get to. That quotation is Isaiah 53. That's in the second half of the book. Therefore they could not believe, for again, Isaiah said, He has blinded their eyes and hardened their hearts, lest they see with their ears, understand with their heart, and turn, and I would heal them. Isaiah said these things because he saw his glory, spoke of him. In this one passage in John, you have two of the sections of Isaiah cited, which some would have us believe is written by one person, it's written by another, and they're both, John, inspired by the Spirit, says, Isaiah said it. Of course, Isaiah 53, who has believed what the Lord has heard from us? To whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? Then Isaiah 6, 9 and 10, he said, go and say to this people, keep on hearing but do not understand. Keep on seeing but do not perceive. So we read that already, but you see that what, I'm, what I'm driving at. This is one passage in John, cites early Isaiah passage, late Isaiah passage, and attributes both to Isaiah, uh, which is, I think, a good plan to follow rather than going with the devices of men who outsmart themselves sometimes. Also in Romans 9, 27, and in 10, 16 to 21, Paul quotes from Isaiah 10 and, and 53 and 65. I'll, I won't go into the sections in Isaiah. I'll simply read what Paul says. Look at Romans 9, 27. Isaiah cries out concerning Israel. Though the number of the sons of Israel be as the sand of the sea, only a remnant of them will be saved. Romans 10, 16 to 21. But they've not all obeyed the gospel. For Isaiah says, Lord, who has believed what he's heard from us? That's Isaiah 51, 53. So faith comes from hearing and hearing through the word of Christ. But I ask, have they not all heard? Indeed they have. Their voice has gone out to all the earth, their words to the ends of the world. But I ask, did Israel not understand? This is Paul, if you know the passage here, we're going to get into Romans and we study the New Testament. This is Paul arguing for how he discovered by the teaching of the Spirit that God's plan had not failed. That's critical to understanding Romans. It's not as though God's plan had failed, he says, in, Isaiah, in Romans 9. So anyway, you see, you see the flavor. The, the New Testament, we could, we could do a little more of this. Uh, Matthew 3, 3, this is he who was spoken of by the prophet Isaiah, prepare the way of the Lord, make his paths straight. Uh, chapter 12, Verse 17 and 5, this is to fulfill what was spoken by the prophet Isaiah. Behold my servant whom I've chosen, my beloved, with whom my soul is well pleased. I'll put my spirit upon him. He will proclaim justice to the Gentiles. He will not quarrel or cry aloud, nor will anyone hear his voice in the streets. So this is the citations uh, from various portions of Isaiah. Same thing in Luke. I don't want to, don't want to belabor this here, but chapter 3, verses 4 to 6. As it's written in the book of the words of Isaiah the prophet, the voice of one crying in the wilderness, prepare the way of the Lord. And then Acts 8 to 28, the Ethiopian eunuch, he was returning, seated in his chariot, and he was reading the prophet Isaiah. So I, I go for, press for the unity of Isaiah, all 66 chapters written by him. Maybe the video is correct that he wrote it all down and his disciples communicated portions of it later on. I won't haggle over that. But he is the author of all 66 chapters of this. The date and setting, uh, I told you his ministry went from uh, about 740 to 680. He, he ministered 40 years in that time frame. And we have the, I already read it to you from Isaiah 1-1, this vision. The word vision, by the way, is one of the terms used to describe God uh, anointing a prophet. He will give him a burden. It's a heaviness to communicate the truth or a vision to uh, not, not vision as we think of it. I've had a vision of this, but this vision, this, this word of the Lord comes about what was, what is, what will be. Uh, he began his ministry near the end of Uzziah's reign, continued through the reigns of Jotham, Ahaz, and Hezekiah. About the theme and purpose of, of the book, uh, 
The basic theme of the book is that is this is in Isaiah's name. Salvation is of the Lord. Salvation is of the Lord. The word of salvation, one of the reasons people call this an evangelical prophet or the gospel of, of Isaiah, the word salvation in the Hebrew appears 26 times in Isaiah. Now hang on. But only seven times in all the remaining prophetic books. 26 times in Isaiah. Seven in the remaining major prophets and minor prophets. So one fellow wrote, broke it down this way. I like this. Chapters 1 through 39 portray man's great need for salvation. Chapters 40 through 66 reveal God's great provision for salvation. Salvation's of the Lord, not man. He is seen in Isaiah as the supreme ruler, the sovereign Lord of history, the only Savior. And so there's a, there's a theme that salvation belongs to God, the God who judges in righteousness and who shows mercy to, the, to those who, who repent. But what about what we would call keys? We looked at these every, every time we study a book. Obviously, the key word wouldn't surprise you, salvation. The key verses we read to begin our, our study tonight uh, that, that shows uh, that both in the early portion, which has a more con condemnatory tone, and in the latter portion of the book. The key chapter is chapter 53, and I want us to go to that right now. Chapter 53. It is one of the most passionate portraits of the suffering of Jesus. Chapter 53, verse 1. Who has believed what he has heard from us? To whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? For he grew up before him like a young plant, like a root out of dry ground. Remember Jesse's branch earlier in the book? He had no form or majesty that we should look at him, no beauty that we should desire him. Commentators differ over whether they think that's describing just Jesus in his person or Jesus as he was being tortured on the way to Calvary, that he was beaten so beyond recognition that there would be, there would be nothing about him uh, that would be recognizable. He was despised and rejected by men, a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief, as one from whom men hide their faces. Why would you hide your face from somebody? Two, two reasons. Your own shame are too hideous to look upon. He was despised, and we esteemed him not. So what's the movement here? They're describing him in his person. Notice the shift to describe his work. Surely he has borne our griefs and carried our sorrows. Yet we esteemed him stricken, smitten by God, and afflicted. The nature of his suffering would lead people to conclude God has punished this one. Now in that thought process in, the, in this day, God would only punish somebody because he was worthy of being punished. He was a criminal. He was uh, a, re a rebel. But not so this one. He was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. Upon him was the chastisement that brought us peace. This this execution language imposed upon this one, this root sprung up, this tender root. And with his wounds, we are healed. Now, I want to pause a minute. That's, that certainly has been uh, misused by people, but I think we need to embrace the incredible comprehensive power of the work of Jesus Christ. I will say this to you, that 
any, it's, it's not a blanket promise that, that like people use it, but, but it is a hope and a promise of healing. And certainly we are healed spiritually by his wounds. But I believe there comes physical healing. And if it comes to you and to me, it is because of what Jesus Christ did. You've got to understand this. It's not, it's not ever because we deserve it. God's decided to deal differently with us. It is on the basis of the person and work of Jesus Christ. So I think we need to be careful here that we don't, we don't buy into the just hook, line, and sinker that God doesn't want you to be sick because by his stripes we are healed. That's, that's nonsense. But the other ditch would be to dismiss this, to try, to try to make it say less than it says. The chastisement, the, the salvation that comes to us in Jesus is comprehensive. It has to do with our, with our souls, with our minds, our emotions, our wills, our physicality. This powerful picture. Verse 6, now notice, the, still delving in here, we've, to, we've given a brief description of, of his character, of his person, of, of what he has suffered, the work that he's undertaken. And now we look at the reason. All we like sheep, this is verse 6, have gone astray. We have turned every one. It's interesting in the Hebrew. We have turned every one to his own way. And the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. Jesus, in suffering, bears our sin on the tree. He, we have to have good language here. He satisfies divine justice by his suffering and death in the place of sinners. So that Paul says in Romans 3, God can continue to maintain his holy justice, not overlooking sin, not winking at sin, not making exception. And yet in that context, because of what Jesus did, he can justify sinners accept them as righteous, declare them not guilty, not for anything any sinner has done or can do, but only for what Jesus has done, and that received by us by faith. He was oppressed, verse 7. He was afflicted, yet he opened not his mouth. Like a lamb that is led to the slaughter, like a sheep that before its shearers is silent, so he opened not his mouth. By oppression and judgment he was taken away. And as for his generation, who considered that he was cut off out of the land of the living, stricken for the transgression of my people? So if you're going to see his death properly, you're going to see that it, he was cut off from the land of the living for the transgression of my people. And they made his grave with the wicked. Well, he hung between two thieves on either side. And with a rich man in his death, he had a borrowed tomb that belonged to a rich man. Although he had done no violence and there was no deceit in his mouth, yet it was the will of the Lord to crush him he has put him to grief. When his soul makes an offering for guilt, he shall see his offspring. He shall prolong his days. The will of the Lord shall prosper in his hand. Out of the anguish of his soul, he shall see and be satisfied. In other words, he satisfied divine justice by suffering and death in, the place, in our place, and he will be satisfied with the result of that. When he looks as the scripture says, he's going to lead captivity captive to bring us to bring many sons to glory. By his knowledge shall the righteous one, my servant, make many to be accounted righteous. I want you to notice also some of the language here. In prophecy, when the prophet is speaking for God, there are times when he uses the third person singular, he. But also, as, as he's led by the Spirit, there are those times when he speaks and you hear this, by his knowledge shall the righteous one, my servant, that's, he is now speaking 
His mouth is a mouthpiece, and God is speaking about things personally with a first-person pronoun. Make many to be accounted righteous, that's justification, and he shall bear their iniquities, that's uh, substitutionary atonement. Therefore I will divide him a portion with the many, and he shall divide the spoil with the strong. Because he poured out his soul to death. It pleased the Lord to smite him, but he, the servant, poured out his soul to death. Was numbered with the transgressors. He allowed himself to be taken as a common criminal. Because he's identifying, remember, that's the whole point of the incarnation. Yet he bore the sin of many and makes intercession for the transgressors. Now, the, now you've gone from his, from his character to his, uh, to his work, to the reason for it we as sinners, to rescue we as sinners. And then he launches all the way into the heavenlies. He makes intercession for the transgressors. He ever lives to intercede. This, is, this passage, I read it, I marvel. I never read it unmoved. And how anybody could read this and not see in this a person and then ask the question, well, who is such a person? Has a, such a person ever lived? And trace it back to, to Jesus of Nazareth. It's, it just shows you that if the light that is in you is darkness, how great is the darkness, that, the, that blindness comes. And if you see in that Jesus Christ, thank God that you see Jesus Christ there. <laughs> That's the doing of the Lord. But make sure that, it's, that you see it because you identify, you see that He did take your sin. That he was bruised for your sin. Don't let it simply be a historical look for you, but a personal, because it's historical, it is historical, but a personal, this he did for me. For me. And I would love to keep plowing, but it's almost 7.15, and, and we're just now about to launch into the section on seeing Jesus in, uh, in Isaiah. I'm going to have to stop there. Uh, and I confess to you, I am torn. I would love to teach through all of this, but I need to be a good steward of, of your time this evening. And so we'll park it right there. Uh, it'll be picked up next week, Lord willing. And I appreciate you taking this in tonight. Any questions or comments or observations uh, before, we, before we dismiss tonight?